In this video, I'm gonna tell you about 10 things you can do to really help organize and streamline your workspace and your artwork production. So if you're looking to run a successful art business, or perhaps you're an amateur artist who just wants to get things a little bit more organized, that's what I'm going to help you with in this video. Welcome back to my channel. If we haven't met before, my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find lots of other art, business and motivational videos like this one, as well as lots of watercolour tips and techniques and a bit of mixed media too. So please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell notification, you can get notified every time I have a new video for you. So it's a really big myth, isn't it? Artists are disorganised, artists are chaotic. It adds to the creative process. It will actually make you a better artist. Well. I'm calling rubbish on all of that. I think that whatever you do in life, being organized is a big help. Now, it's easy for me to say I'm naturally a fairly organized person, but yet when I started out working as an artist, I made so many mistakes and I produced a lot more artwork than I was expecting to. I got involved in a lot more projects than I was expecting to. I put my art out in a lot more venues than I was expecting to. I ended up in a big old muddle, not knowing what I was doing, what was what, or where anything was. So today I'm going to go through 10 things that amateur artists do that professionals never would when it comes towards um, organising your work and organising your workspace. Now I also, later in this video, I'm going to tell you about a free download I have for you that's going to give you 50 things that amateur artists do that professionals never would. Now whether you want to create a, uh, a career as an artist or whether you're a hobby painter, or perhaps you've retired recently, you just want to take your art a lot more seriously, you're going to find this video and this free download really, really helpful. So let's get started. So the first mistake is just general disorganisation, that disorganised attitude. The attitude that, well, I'm an artist, I have to be disorganised. Well, it's nonsense. I saw um, on a, there's a, a famous sort of um, blogging site that blogs about artist studios, and they put a meme up on Facebook yesterday and said, um, you know, if you have a disorganised, messy studio, you're a better artist. And they put a picture up of a very famous, successful artist studio, and he was working in a really big old mess. And of course, he's still a very good artist, but you know, correlation is not causation and one thing doesn't necessarily lead to another and I'm sorry but you know if you're constantly looking for your paints and everything's in a scruffy old mess it's not going to help you in any way so the first tip for you is just to try and get out of this mindset that because you're an artist you have to be a chaotic disorganized mess so the second thing that amateur artists do that's actually caused by being disorganized is they let people down or they just back out of things. So, you know, you may have agreed to enter an exhibition and then you find later on that, oh, it's not a very good venue, there's unlikely to be many visitors, or perhaps you um, you discover the fees were much higher than you expected. You know, you don't think that you can afford to get all the framing, that whatever it is that you have agreed to, that you're now thinking, oh, what did, what did I do? That was a really bad idea. How stupid am I? It doesn't matter, you've got to go through with it because if you get a reputation in this business of letting people down, then they simply won't invite you to do things. So if you've agreed to do something and you realise later on you're not going to make any profit out of it, it's a, it's a waste of your time. It doesn't matter. You said you would do it, so do it. Next time, learn from your mistake and make better decisions, but don't let people down ever. Now the next one is a really big one and it's lucky that I have any forehead left from doing this every time I see it come up on some kind of Facebook thread where people have got into trouble over commissions. So what amateur artists do is they take on commissions and they don't even agree a price before starting, they don't agree the size that it's going to be, you know, they don't know that they can actually do the work, they start to panic, I don't know if I'm good enough. You know, I have seen, you know, if I had a pound or a dollar for every time I have seen amateur artists get in trouble with commissions, you know, I would be incredibly rich. You should never, ever start a commission without having all of the terms laid out and without having a price agreed, especially if this is something you've agreed to do for a friend or a family. It becomes very awkward. I've actually seen people post say, well, you know, my, my cousin asked me to do this. I don't know if I should ask for any money. I don't know if she was expecting to pay for it. Why, why get yourself in this situation? Lay everything out at the beginning. Of course, it's awkward about talking about price, but it's far more awkward if you've already done the work because, you know, you're putting yourself in a really, really bad situation. What you need for a commission is a contract. Now, that sounds like a big legal word, 
but it only has to be an email, even a text. It has to be something that you have written down and laid out exactly what you're doing and when and how it will look and what size it is, what medium it is, what color it is, um, that what price it is particularly. You lay everything out, whether it's framed or not framed, you lay everything out at the beginning just in an email and they write back and they say, yes, that's fine. In legal terms, you have yourself a contract. So please stop getting into trouble with commissions. I might actually do another video just about working to commission. If you would find that useful, do let me know in the comments. So the fourth mistake that amateur artists make is not organizing and keeping track of their artwork. Now, nowadays, my artwork is tied down. I have a reference number for every painting. I have a spreadsheet that the reference number goes on. I have a spreadsheet that tells me where that piece of art is. Is it in the studio? Is it out at the printers being scanned perhaps? Where is it? Is it on display in a gallery? I need to know, perhaps it sells from my online shop. I need to know where it is. I need to know what I've done. I need to know when I made it and where it is stored, whether it's framed or unframed. If I've made a series perhaps of lino prints, I need to know how many they are, which ones are sold. Now, if I've done sheet clay prints, I need to know which ones I've had, how many I've had printed, because if you're doing limited edition prints, you need to keep track of how many you have sent out because you have made a legal contract with your buyer not to make more of than um, is in the edition number. So you really must find a way, again, if you'd like a video on this, I'll make it for you, but you really must find a way of numbering, referencing, labeling your artwork and keeping some kind of record of it I used to do this manually in a book. I now use spreadsheets because I've been brought into the uh, into the modern world. Spreadsheets were really difficult for me, but now I wouldn't be without them. So even if you're just starting out, you're really going to thank me later if you organize and list all of your artwork. So the next thing which I guarantee pretty much every amateur artist has done, which has led to heartache, is they've painted a picture, they've sold the picture and it's gone. And then they think, oh, I don't have any record of that. I didn't even photograph it. So one thing you must get into the habit of doing is taking clear photographs of all of your work as soon as you finish it before it's framed. If you're a watercolorist and you're framing behind glass or any artwork on paper behind glass, you need to photograph it before it goes out into the world. Again, if you'd like a video on photography tips, I'll give that one to you. Um, you also want to consider getting your work scanned. Now, I produce gicle prints of my paintings and therefore I need a proper scan in order to um, in order to run that print off later on. So I never let a painting go out without having it photographed and scanned. If you want more information on that, I'll make um, future videos on it. But at the very, very least, take a clear photo of your artwork. Even if you're not working as a professional artist, you're so going to regret it if you don't have that memory. The next one's a really simple tip. You already know it, but maybe you don't do it. And it's not just a tip for artists, it's a tip for everybody. Back up your computer onto a separate hard drive, an external hard drive, one that you plug in once a month. I do mine at the beginning of the month. And then if you work in um, somewhere that's a little bit vulnerable, perhaps you hire a unit to work in or you hire a studio where your computer could be stolen. Maybe you work in a wooden studio like me and Perhaps it burns down. You're going to need to have that separate hard drive stored in a separate place. So I back up my studio computer so it's a separate hard drive and then I take the hard drive into the house so that it's actually stored in a different building. So whichever way you organize it, you need to back up. Of course, you can back up onto cloud storage, but nothing is 100% secure, not even cloud storage. So I do suggest you back up onto one of those external hard drives. Even if you don't have to worry about fire or theft, hard drives on computers can break all the time. My partner is actually, he's not a professional engineer of uh, computers, but he's very, very good at them and he fixes a lot of friends' computers. And the amount of times when he's tried to restore data, you cannot always recover data if the hard drive has broken and it can break like that with no warning whatsoever. So back up your computer, which includes all of your graphic files and all of your nice photographs of your artwork, back up your computer to a separate hard drive once a month. So the next important thing is emails. Once you start to work professionally as an artist, or even if you're an amateur artist, and you're entering lots of exhibitions and doing some craft fairs perhaps in your spare time, 
you're going to start getting a lot of emails. If you have a website, you're going to get email inquiries through that website. If you have an online shop, you're going to get um, not just sales, but you're going to get lots of emails from the people that run the online shop. I have lots of folders in my Thunderbird and um, what I do is when I finish with an email, I file it in one of these folders. Um, for instance, for each gallery that I had working, I would have a folder for my website. I've got a folder for my art classes. I've got a folder for anything I might be invoiced for and also for household stuff. So when my emails come in, what I do is I try to do this each day. Sometimes if I'm out of the studio teaching, it might be every three days, but I catch up. What I do is I go through each email that has come in, that's fresh in, and I look at it. Is it just rubbish? Does it need deleting? If it's something that you signed up for, you know, some product you signed up for and you just keep seeing that your emails keep coming, you keep deleting them, stop wasting your time, scroll to the bottom and click the unsubscribe button. Don't do that to my emails, they're fantastic emails, why would you do that? But so unsubscribe from all those other emails that you no longer need, look at each email and if it needs an answer, answer it and then file it or delete it as is appropriate. I'm pretty obsessive about filing emails, I do like to be able to go back and find them later on. Now, occasionally an email may come in that leads to a lot more work. So there's a temptation to leave it in your inbox to remind you to do the work, but this is a really bad idea because then more emails come in and, and before you know it, that email's buried and you've forgotten to do the work. So if you open an email that really needs a lot of attention, take time to write yourself a note of it or create a separate folder on your desk so that you'll be going through your papers and you'll see to do that. If you do those things online, use spreadsheets, that's fine too. I tend to like, for things that are really important, I tend to like a good old piece of paper because it does actually remind me to do the work when I see it laying on my desk. But whatever you need to do, sort through these emails, get them filed, get them deleted, get them answered as and when they come in, and then you'll be nice and organized and you won't have that sort of horror that there's this massive out of control inbox and maybe something important is buried. So the next area that you'll need to organize as you become more professional at your artwork is your art materials themselves and particularly with um, colors. So when you get started, you might only have eight tubes of paint or they don't need organizing. You just put them in a box, you know where they are. There's my paint, I'll use my paint. But if you start getting lots of colors, I've got well over 40 or 50 different tubes of watercolor now. Um, it's exactly the same, you know, whether you use pastels or oil paints or whatever you use. Why am I waving a pen around? I don't know. Um, Whatever art materials you use, you want to organize them in terms of color. So what I do, I've got sort of a seven color system that I use. I'll tell you what it is, you can use it too, but it doesn't matter what system you use as long as you know where your colors are. Now what I do is I group mine in primaries, secondaries and earth colors. So what you've got first of all is you've got the first three categories are your primary colors. So you've got red, you've got blue, you've got yellow. Then you've got your secondary colors. You've got your greens, your purples, and your oranges. I forgot the secondary colors then, what's the matter with my brain? Um, things like pinks you can put in with reds. So there you go, you've got your six categories, your primary colors, your secondary colors. Then you've got your earth colors, which are your ochres, basically your browns and grays. If you're an acrylic painter, you've probably got black and white in there as well, so you can put those with your neutrals. Now there are some colors you might be thinking, oh, yellow ochre, you know, is it an in, do I put it in the earth colors, do I put it in the yellows? Maybe you've got a red brown, do I put it with the neutrals, do I put it with the reds? It doesn't matter as long as you personally know where it is. Now why this is so important is that if you run out, say I run out of lemon yellow, I don't want to have to look through 60 tubes of, of, of paint to see if I bought another lemon yellow or if I have a different tube of lemon yellow in another brand. I just want to look through my yellows. I've only got a few of them. Straight away, I'll be able to see if I need to order that color. So by keeping in color um, color orders like that, uh, you can do this in your palette as well. I did a good video on um, organizing your watercolor palette. I'll link to that up above. You can do this in your palette as well. Once you know where your colors are and what they are, then you'll find it easier to order them before they run out and you're not gonna be in the situation where you're trying to finish a painting and you haven't got any paint. Of course, it's not just paint colors. Everything that you own, the more you can organize it, the quicker it is to find. I don't know about you, but my uh, my partner, his garage is a real old mess and he always says that thing. I know where it is. I know where everything is. Does he know where it is? No, he doesn't because he's always looking for stuff. And this is not just me being sexist. Doesn't matter if you're male or female. If you are always saying it's a mess, but I know where everything is. Stop kidding yourself. You're going to lose stuff. 
sort your things out, the neater you can be. Obviously, you don't have to be 100% neat, but the more tidy and the more organized you are, the more time you're gonna have for doing painting and the less time you're gonna be looking for stuff. Now, the next mistake that amateur artists make, and it's certainly one that I made myself, is not keeping their customers' details. Now, I read a book when I first started out, I forget what it was called, but um, basically the lady who wrote that book, it's a good book about art business, and she said the number one mistake that artists make is to not keep in touch with their customers. And this is the thing, isn't it? You know, if somebody bought a painting from you, do they just go? Do you stay in touch with them? So what I want you to do is try and keep all of your customers' records. This is not just people that buy from you. This is business associates as well. And to build up those email mailing lists, it's really the best way of keeping in touch with people. Don't rely on a secondary platform. Don't rely on the fact that in the Etsy um, shop, you can find those previous customers. You never know what's gonna to happen to a third party platform. You wanna keep those emails yourself and build up those email lists so that you can get in touch with people. This doesn't mean spamming them every week but it just means being able to get in touch with them. Now, there are all sorts of laws have come in recently. As we all started using the internet more and we started getting inundated with spam, there are rules now. And certainly in Europe, I'm not allowed to add people to a mailing list without asking their permission. So ask permission. Don't let those customers go. Don't let people just fade into the background without storing um, addresses if you've got them, phone numbers, emails. You want to be able to get in touch with people again for genuine reasons when you need to. Now this next mistake I can say with hand on heart that I um, I didn't make but lots of people do and I see amateur artists get into trouble with it all the time and this is registering your business for tax and keeping proper accounts. It's really really simple to do. I now use spreadsheets. I even have a lady who works for me once a week and she does my accounts because I hate maths and I hate accounts. But however bad you are at maths it doesn't matter. You can at least keep track of what comes in and what goes out and do look into tax laws as soon as you start selling anything. There may be, if you're just doing it as a side hobby and you have a full-time job, there is some provision in UK law for you to earn a little bit as a hobby. But it's a really, really big mistake that a lot of artists make is to start working and not register for tax. It doesn't matter if, you know, and I hear them say to me, they say, well, I'm not gonna earn enough to pay tax this year because in the UK, certainly in most countries, we have a tax allowance. You can earn a certain amount of money before you pay tax. So people say to me, well, it's okay. I'm not gonna go over the tax threshold. I don't have to pay any tax. So I haven't bothered to register. Well, good luck proving that to the tax man. You need to register even if you're not going to pay tax. So get it started right from the beginning. As soon as you decide that you're going to be working as a professional artist or that you're going to be selling as a hobby seller, get in touch with the tax man, look on the website, find out what you need to do in your country and get it done. And for goodness sake, keep records of everything. And that includes expenses. Certainly here under UK tax law, there are things that I cannot put fully against my business, but I can claim. I can claim a little bit for the electricity I use in my studio. I can claim a portion of the petrol I put in my car. Get yourself on a solid footing right from the beginning. It does not have to be complicated. It only needs to be a list. Keep your receipts and don't ever let the tax man decide how much they think you owe because you didn't bother keeping proper records. Now at the start of this video, I said I had a free download for you and you can download that PDF guide by um, looking in the description of this video. That's the text underneath the video. You might need to click a little down arrow and just expand the text so you can find the link. I've also got lots of other um, really useful links in there for you too. Now, this guide, what it'll do is it'll tell you 50 things that amateur artists do that professionals never would. It's not just about organization. So you've got the 10 tips I've given you today, but you've got another 40 in there as well. It's about practical things like exhibiting your work and presenting your work, but also mindset and um, just how to behave as a professional artist. You're gonna find it really, really useful. Can I also ask that you click the like button on this video because it just tells uh, YouTube that it's a good video. If you can share the video with somebody else that might find it useful, that would be great too. You can also watch another one of my videos right now.